Um, for those of you that have not met me, my name is John Lynn. I'm with Invisia. I'm one of the co-organizers uh, for the Docker Chicago meetup group, along with Mark Panthover, who you'll see shortly, or I think just hopped in. Um, so first and foremost, I really hope everybody out there and their families have been able to stay uh, safe and healthy, uh, and most importantly, sane um, during this nationwide quarantine period. Uh, we wanted to try to figure out a way to continue to engage the technology community during this time. Um, so we'll be doing these virtual meetups uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, as long as this continues to go on, um, we're going to try to do a couple per month. So um, if you have a presentation that you'd like to share and show, uh, or if you have a topic that you'd like to hear a little bit about, please reach out to us, let us know. Uh, we'll figure out a way to either get you involved or figure out a way to get the information that you're looking for out to you. Um, we have a great presentation today um, from Bud Citizena, who is a platform engineer at Top Step Trader around creating just-in-time QA environments. Uh, so Mark will be helping to moderate this presentation. Uh, he'll give you all the information around how to ask questions um, and so on and so forth. So I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. So uh, again, we're, we want to just you know, emphasize uh, we're looking for people to share in the community is a great way uh, to do that in a virtual setting. Um, so if you're, if you're interested, please uh, reach out and let John know or myself and, and we'll, uh, we'll get you set up. So for today, we're excited to, to hear from Bud. Uh, and, and what I'd like to do is if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, uh, please drop them into the chat window to the panelists, organizers and panelists and we should be able to. Uh, I, I will. I will kind of moderate that process so that Bud doesn't have to, you know, look all over the place at the uh, chat window and try to remember what he's talking about, all that kind of stuff. So, so we're excited with that. Bud, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, so my name is Bud, and I'm a platform engineer at Top Step. Uh, Top Step is a company that you know funds traders and uh, you know, so that they can do their trading safely with our money. So we kind of fund them so they don't have to risk their own capital. Um, so uh, I joined about two years ago, almost two years now. Uh, actually my second anniversary is coming up sometime next week, I think. Um, and uh, uh, so we have a rail stack um, and uh, also uh, a Python Django stack. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, running most of our stuff on EC2 uh, uh, without any kind of, um, a dockerization or anything of that sort. So, um, you know, we've been um, uh, trying to kind of um, enhance the experience of uh, being able to scale and uh, being able to uh, rapidly iterate on the uh, um, on the code base without, you know, causing issues. So that, that that's kind of one of the motivations for doing all this. So I kind of wanted to talk about how we went about uh, creating a just-in-time, uh, you know, QA environment. Uh, when I joined, there was only one QA person and uh, one QA environment, so it wasn't a problem. You know, he pretty much took care of the QA box. Um, there were still some pain points, obviously, because um, let's say that I was working on a feature branch and I, you know, passed it to QA, and then uh, somebody else worked on a different feature branch. Um, you know, he would have to timeshare that uh, QA box, and um, sometimes he would find an issue and then, you know, throw that story back to us, in which case, uh, you know, when we are doing changes, he would have to redeploy because between now and then he would have to be testing somebody else's work. So um, things got even more difficult when we hired, you know, um, the second QA person. So then uh, they were both trying to timeshare this one box. So I ended up setting up another box. And, you know, it, it, it's a lot of process trying to set up something directly on EC2. Uh, you know, and our stack is on ops work, which is like a chef based uh, um, uh, stack that uh, EC2 has for doing like Ruby on Rails. Um, so, you know, we wanted to be more uh, agile and we wanted to be able to kind of test a branch on its own. So, you know, this is my um, elevator page. Uh, so kind of provide uh, the ability for, you know, parallelly testing different feature branches and kind of isolating resources. This is another area that we've kind of been having trouble, which is um, especially the database was shared, was shared between some of the QA, um, you know, between different QA branches. So uh, sometimes you might do like a, like a DB migration, which, uh, you know, breaks something. And then 
you need to kind of when you try to test some some other brands, you find that uh, the deploy breaks, and then you have to kind of roll back and kind of intervene and go into the database and all that stuff. So uh, it's a lot easier if you just you know spin up a brand new database. You know, you know all the resources being very fresh, uh, untouched by previous uh, things that you've been doing. So you know that that's another thing that you know Docker obviously allows us to isolate all that all those resources. And as we make changes, as we go back and forth between, okay, testing, finding bugs, doing more testing, uh, we want to kind of automate that uh, auto deployment over and over without having to intervene, without having to, you know, reset branches and all that. Uh, you know, one thing we used to do is, uh, you know, have this long running QA branch kind of, so then you would take the feature branch, uh, get reset hard, you know, <laughs> QA into that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure um, some of you here are probably experiencing or have experienced in the past, um, you know, things like this. And uh, this is kind of where we wanted to kind of improve our situation. So, given, uh, having said that, I want to kind of um, preface with what I'm about to say. This is um, still work in progress. Um, you know, we got this stuff. I started working on this um, towards end of last year. Um, and we, you know, kind of started using this, you know, a little a few weeks ago. So it's, it's pretty brand new. Uh, and we still do have our old uh, QA boxes as well. Uh, it still serves a purpose because we haven't used Docker all the way throughout to production. Uh, we've kind of gone QA and staging at this point with Docker. And the next step is to go production with Docker. Um, so, uh, so there's that, and then there's also a lot of learnings that are continuous happening. There are things that I obviously I want to improve more. Um, so with this, I wanted to kind of talk about the higher level solution and kind of so that you understand at a high level what we're trying to do, and then you could kind of come up with your own uh, version of this. I'm not saying the way we did things is exactly right, and you just follow the same template. Or you might be on a different cloud provider. You might, uh, you know, might not want to use the same stack that we're using um, for building the solution. But I wanted to talk about our approach and the high level solution that we did. So, so basically this starts out with, uh, you know, the user, you know, working on a feature branch, say Fubar in this case, and pushing it to GitHub uh, as a branch. So in this case, you wanted to do kind of a self-service. So, so far that has been the pattern. So uh, we didn't automate, um, the spinning up of QA boxes yet. Um, so you would, in this case, go to um, uh, like a code build in our case. It's some, you go to some interface and click, click a button, right? So what this does is it uh, spins up a pipeline uh, specific to that branch, a pipeline that kind of tracks the branch uh, for any changes going forward. Um, and this pipeline is it's sort of a temporary pipeline that we are uh, setting up for the life cycle of that branch. Um, the pipeline is created uh, when the branch is, you know, essentially pushed to GitHub. Uh, again, manually and just at this point, but we can automate that. Um, and then it's destroyed once, you know, it's essentially merged uh, to master or develop or whatever, you know, Git, Git flow that you you happen to use. Um, so the pipeline itself, currently in our in our uh, QA environments, has, um, you know, three stages. The, the first obviously is by the pipeline will uh, pull the Git repo um, and, and the branch, and then it'll start building uh, the Docker image. And, um, and once that image is built, it then pushes that Docker image to the Docker registry. Now, in our case, we are using the Amazon ECR registry, um, which is their private um, Docker registry. Um, so once that Docker registry has been, uh, the image has been pushed and ha it has been tagged. So in our case, we are tagging it with the, with the, with the branch name. You know, obviously certain, uh, certain characters aren't supported in the branch name, so we kind of have to sometimes, you know, mutate that or, uh, you know, find and replace kind of stuff, but essentially it's the branch name. And then we um, uh, go to the next step, step of uh, spinning up uh, an instance using that. Uh, image um, on the ECS cluster, so the Docker ECS cluster. So you can think this is as spinning it up on a Docker cloud of some sort. 
um, maybe uh, Kubernetes, maybe ECS in our case, uh, you know, maybe Docker form if you if you want to. So th those are like the different options. So so that kind of completes the deployment process. So the next thing we do is obviously the user then needs a unique URL to go and hit and be able to see the deployment. Um, so again, we use the same branch name dot uh, docker dot in our case top step trader uh, dot com, which is our domain. And uh, and uh, you know we we so the user will uh, you know hit DNS obviously so and then kind of resolve to that and then end up eventually being routed to that container instance that we are running. Uh, so this is the high level and there are different options that you could use to achieve uh, something like this. So with that, I want to go in and kind of talk about um, the solution uh, in more detail of how we do it and what we use, right? So obviously our Git is on GitHub. Um, so the, the button clicking, all that happens, of the, the kicking the kicking it off happens in a code build. So code build um, is like a build uh, step that uh, uh, Amazon has with the, on AWS. Um, so code pipeline and code build go hand in hand. And basically um, every step of a code pipeline is a code build, but you can also have standalone code build. So we have a long running code build um, to kick off uh, a deployment. And uh, that in turn creates a brand new pipeline, a code pipeline, which then goes and does the actual deployment. Um, now, when we were starting out, you know, I wanted to initially have a long running code pipeline, but then, uh, you know, you kind of go through that learning process and you realize, you know, maybe uh, that's not a good idea. It's, it's much easier to just spin up a code pipeline on the fly. Obviously, there's some inconvenience with that in the sense, you know, you go and look at the, go to the code pipeline, you have a bunch of code pipelines, people having created them. So, you know, then you got to think of how do you clean that up eventually? Will people follow through and kind of destroy once they're done, you know? So again, the, one of the solution is again, automating all that uh, down the line. So we haven't done all that automation yet. Um, so we kind of hold uh, QA or QA people to kind of say, okay, once you're done testing, please go and destroy the infrastructure. Um, so if you look at this diagram, um, if it's visible, it's kind of small, but uh, basically uh, the way it works is, um, the way the pipeline itself works is, um, it pulls from GitHub and then it pushes um, um, the the code into an S3 bucket. And at that point, you kind of lose the fact that it's Git anymore because it, you, it's tra it, it, it removes all the Git uh, artifacts. You lose history and all that stuff. So, so one of the things that we do at this stage is also to kind of capture what's the Git SHA, the, the, the head of the Git, so that we can kind of uh, know which version of the code we are de deploying. Um, so we kind of store that in the Docker image as a as an environment variable, um, so that we know, we can refer back to it. Um, so then, uh, so all that happens through the build step, uh, the the creation of the Docker image, and then we push it to the repository, which is the ECR, as you can see, there's the orange color uh, icon, and then we go to the deploy step, which then goes and deploys it to ECS. Uh, so I'm just showing you that two branches can simultaneously do this. Um, and then you have the access pattern, which is the user coming in. And uh, in this case, we use row 53 for the, um, the DNS resolution. And we have a wildcard domain in that case. So anything star dot uh, docker dot goes to um, a load balancer that we've set up, uh, an application load balancer. Uh, the reason we <clears throat> went with the application load balancer is also so that we can deal with HTTPS, so we can do SSL termination through that easily. <clears throat> and Amazon actually gives you a free a wildcard <clears throat> SSL cert, so it's kind of uh, it's pretty neat that you don't have to, you know, set that up separately or you know try to get that through a, through a third party. So it's it's a way to make that happen easily. But basically, that load balancer uh, routes all the traffic to um, the EC. Um, the ECS container that is running traffic. So traffic, I'll talk a little bit more, more about it. Uh, it's basically our uh, dynamic HTTP reverse proxy. So think of it as uh, a kind of an Nginx um, like thing, but the beauty of it is it's, it's very easy to config and it um, 
can be configured dynamically without having to even restart the service or having to edit any config files. It, it can self-config itself, if it makes sense. It can self-configure -con itself. Um, so um, all the traffic goes to, all the, all the web traffic goes to the traffic service. And the traffic service then knows, depending on some of the hints that it gets from like looking at the HTTP headers and things, where to send that uh, request to which container to send it to. Um, and it, it, it monitors containers. So as containers are coming online, new services being you know, spun up, it knows that, okay, now I need to send this post to this container. If not, it'll just show like a 404 page saying, oops, that service is not found. So that's kind of how, how it works. So let me just do a quick grand tour of um, using screenshots without trying to do a live demo here. <laughs> I'm gonna just uh, uh, show how it works in, in, in action. So yeah, in our case, we have this um, code build project that is longstanding called Futures Docker Pipeline. And then you would go in and you would type in you would um, fill in this variable um, with your branch, and then there's uh, the action which is defaulted to create. So it'll create that. So you pretty much enter the branch, click start build. Again, this step can be automated easily. Uh, that ends up creating a pipeline, okay? And then the pipeline, you know, I kind of, uh, you can see there's like a naming convention that we're using. See, it's a QA means it's a QA pipeline. Uh, for staging, it'll be like staging. Um, and then you have like a shortened version of the branch with some MD5 things going on just to make it a unique pipeline. Uh, but basically it kicks off by itself. Whenever, the, whenever you push a new code change to the GitHub, this pipeline will self you know, run. It'll see that something changed through GitHub hook and then it'll start building it. But if you want, you can manually you know, build it as well. Like there's the, that button at the top, the orange one, uh, the release button, you can always, you know, if you want, redeploy the same code. Um, or if you realize that you need to make another change and you just, you want to stop the, the current build process, you can do that. Um, and you can go into each code build also and look at the log, see that it's building. Um, also, if like one of the steps fail for some reason, it's not shown in the screenshot, but there's a button that allows you to just retry that step. So it's kind of nice. Once everything is done, yeah, this is, you can go into then the instance. So in this case, you know, I'm calling it future, one, two, three, four, you know, dash full bar, docker.topsetrade, and then we have the status page, which is kind of enables us to monitor which version of the app that we are running, which database migration are we on, and so on, so on and so forth. So that's the shot that I was talking about that we capture uh, early on, um, and then we kind of inject into the Docker uh, image itself. Um, so uh, you can also like see what's going on if you go to the ECS on on uh, AWS. Um, so what we the way this works is we spin up uh, um, a service for the app. So there are two ways you can run ta uh, run um, uh, stuff on ECS. You can run it as a task on its own, just just like a one-off task, or you can run it as a long running thing called a service. So the nice thing with running a service is it kind of monitors the, um, it monitors the, the, the thing that's being run. So if it dies for some reason, uh, it'll auto you know, restart. You can say, I want this many uh, you know, uh, instances to be running, this many containers of this, uh, this many instances of the container running. Uh, so it'll do all that self healing and monitoring. So that's nice because if you if you run a task directly, then you know if the task you know exists if one of the container exists and it's an essential container, everything the whole service will go down. Um, so that's why we kind of create a task as the service, and the service takes care of orchestrating all the stuff inside the task. Um, so once you go into the service, you can see the tasks that are running, and then you know kind of get more details. Um, and then, you know, once you're done, you would go back to that same uh, previous uh, code bill and, you know, just change the word uh, from apply uh, to create or delete. Okay, so I uh, wanted to talk about a little bit of the, the stack, a little bit in detail, the building block. Not a real quick question. But are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, just, just take a real quick. Um, so 
if anybody has any uh, questions, I just wanted to remind you just to, to, to send them along. But one question I had, so, and, and I might've missed this because I was distracted for just a moment, but <clears throat> when you look at your uh, QA and uh, staging pipelines, do they, each of them rebuild the containers or does your staging just use the existing container and redeploy that? Right, so in our case, um, the staging and the QA are yeah, completely decoupled. Um, so yeah, I know it's not, <laughs> it's not the, the, the recommended, uh, you know, moving the same artifact along the pipeline uh, kind of a thing, um, because it also mirrors our, the way we kind of uh, merge, we use Git flow. So we kind of, you know, QA a branch and then we merge it to the develop and then we kind of deploy develop into staging. Um, so when we go into production with Docker, the plan is to obviously move that artifact across from staging to production. Uh, but the QA itself is, yeah, it's a complete throwaway, you know, test and throwaway kind of situation. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, that just jumped out at me, kind of the immutable server pattern being yeah, somewhat, uh, <laughs> I don't want to use the word violated, but maybe. So, all right, cool. Um, so let's see if we have anything else here. Coming in, um, yep, so I don't think we have anything. Oh, how do you handle databases across multiple QA environments? Um, is there a job to mock up data dummy? That's, that's a really interesting question. You know, a lot of times folks will use some sort of script to seed a test database. And obviously, mm -hmm. if your branch um, introduces schema changes, you need to change that and populate it and, and do all that stuff. Do you guys have any uh, approaches for that that you can share with the, the group today? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, yeah, th this is one area of contention before with our old way of doing it. We had a long running database on RDS for QA and we would come into these, not often, but sometimes uh, conflicting uh, you know, changes that needs to be rolled back uh, manually. Um, so uh, the current approach is we actually run a, a Postgres database as a sidecar along with the the other stuff. So uh, when we spin up the ECS service uh, for the QAs, we actually spin up also a Postgres along with it. And then we run migration um, that kind of sees the database. Uh, it sets up the database and it sees it. Um, that also forces people um, to kind of um, automate the seeding more uh, because one of the things that you also get into when you have a long running QA database is that QA folks start, you know, start creating different profiles to test, uh, but it's all done by hand and it's not in code. So when you do this, you know, you're stuck with a fresh database every time you, you know, deploy. Um, right. So you kind of need to go and now automate that side of things. Uh, okay. So yeah, we do that. But for staging, we obviously spin up on RDS and the production is on RDS. Right. So, so would you use? So, are there any sort of schema change? You know, uh, staging any of the schema scripts with, that you would use against your, for instance, you take a snapshot of production, pull it back to staging, and then you apply those schema changes and do that as a, a part of the pipeline. Is that the vision, or is that kind of where you guys are at at this point, or is, is that something in the future? Uh, no, it's happening right now. So, uh, so basically. Um, so that's a good question. So one of the things I do as part of um, spinning up the ECS services, there, there, is, there, there is a container that runs the migrations, the database migrations. And it, it's a one-off, it runs and it exits. And, uh, and um, it, it waits for the database container to first spin up and then it runs. And then only the app kind of spins up. So the app wait, waits for that container to die or kind of exit and then it starts spinning up. So that's kind of a nice thing with the ECS is you can kind of give that kind of de uh, dependencies between containers. Um, something that I've seen a little, it kind of, you could do that with Docker Compose too. Yeah, you could do that with, by, by the depends. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of helps to kind of say, first this has to happen, then, the next, then, then everything else can happen, you know, kind of having that dependency. Yeah, and those those dependencies can be a little tricky. Sometimes they're just looking for the PID one, and not necessarily, for instance, the database is ready to take traffic. So, just a little note of warning to everybody tuning in at home, right? So, um, let's see. Um, 
So have you had to handle, um, oh, multiple changes between our changes uh, between multiple services where, so you have a dependency between service A and service B and you need to test them together is the question. So, and how did you deal with that? Um, so you're talking about like, if you had a, a lot of different services and di uh, differences right. between them. Yeah, yeah I, I, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. So unfortunately yeah. we're um, still mostly a monolith with a lot of third party services that we use, uh, mm -hmm. like partner services. Um, so yeah, it's not that much of an issue. Uh, but I would imagine um, at that point, you would uh, need some way to orchestrate the different versions of the services um, yeah. when you do the deployment. And uh, generally, so that's what people use. It would complicate. Yeah, people generally would use the feature branch exactly for that, right? So that you would be working in the same branch, the two people working on, if it's assuming it's different people, would have those, those uh, consistent changes within that feature branch. Um, so then when that gets built, they would test one another as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, so, so the, the monolith gets you out of that. So see, monoliths are not all bad. I think that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm checking the questions over here. The other thing I was going to come back and ask you uh, quickly about, Bud, was the, uh, the uh, idea you said a sidecar for the database. So... I don't know, you know, exactly. So, so I mean, obviously in Kubernetes, we see that cars, you know, have multiple containers in the same pod. So are you saying you're adding in, you have an, another container running the database or are you running that database inside the same container as the application? Okay. No, I, I meant it's in uh, as another container. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so. not, not within the same uh, Docker image. Although yeah. we, we do do that for Nginx. We do run an Nginx, which kind of breaking the rule a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the reason we introduced Nginx in this case was really more for filtering because, you know, we, we don't really want people, like we were seeing people were trying to hit like various URLs, PHP and all that crap, right? So we wanted to kind of create uh, an allowed list of um, URLs. So we kind of do that filtering through Nginx. So from that per perspective, Nginx is part of the, you know, the app and we kind of, in, in that case, kind of break the rule and kind of run Nginx in the same container because we don't want to scale that separately anyway. Cool, so, so there's um, another question, um, just a general question um, about um, using traffic. Um, mm -hmm. You were mentioning that they have not used traffic uh, with ECS services and I'm in the same boat, um, used it with Swarm um, and uh, I've not used it with Kubernetes, um, been mostly working with Nginx there, but can you tell us what, I mean, and I had that kind of the same question, right? So, so when you're using Swarm, the way it works is it <coughs> listens for system events, Docker system events, or changes to the cluster. And basically it just says, hey, is there a label for me? In other words, do I need to reconfigure my service that's wrong? So how does that work with, with uh, ECS in, in running that? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and uh, I'm sorry I don't have a great answer for that because <laughs> it's oh, kind of a bottleneck right now for us. So unfortunately, traffic the current version traffic two doesn't support ECS. Um, and in the beginning, I was holding my breath, uh, hoping they would. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of losing my faith on that. So currently, our solution for QA is, I mean, obviously the we're running everything in one EC2 instance. So we can scale, we cannot scale it easily uh, without figuring out some other kind of a convention. Like we could probably scale by, so I'm running traffic as a daemon service. So if I spin up another EC2 instance, it'll run another traffic. So traffic right now is just monitoring Docker, it's the Docker sock, right? Um, so that is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a problem. Um, uh, one solution is to go and use the old traffic you know, the older version, it does support ECS. Again, I don't know with the changes that ECS is making, whether there are breaking changes or we lose features or whatnot. But yeah, that, that is a bit of a problem with the solution at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, so, and again, the pattern I normally see when people just get to scale out a little bit is that they'll be more likely to stand up actually a swarm cluster and then more high availability cluster yeah. and then run it uh, as a part of that cluster. So, 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 but is that, was that the last slide that you had? That's another thing I wanted to 
question or do you have yeah, more? This was, yeah, this was pretty much the last slide. I just wanted okay. to kind of I wanted to make sure uh, everybody knew that. show the different components. Um, so the other thing is using Terraform is it's been really great for most of this stuff because uh, you know the, the, the from the pipeline creation to even the in, creating the instances ETS, uh, we just do it through the Terraform apply and destroy. Um, so that's kind of been uh, nice. Um, I would say compared to having to use AWS console commands directly, uh, the AWS API, um, because it does the state, state management. Um, we are kind of abusing a little bit of the Terraform workspaces as a hack for this, um, for the QA, because uh, we also kind of create a different workspace uh, per branch, and that kind of using that to isolate um, the different um, states. So I usually use the workspace as a proxy to saying, okay, this is these are the pipelines you probably have. These are probably the services that are set up, and then kind of check into that workspace and kind of destroy it from there. Um, but there are other ways around it. Obviously, you can use, you know, key value. You know, uh, obviously, the the Terraform state is storing on S3, uh, so we can, you know, uh, prefix all that uh, with your own key and kind of do it that way as well. Um, but yeah, um, again, we also thinking Fargate in the beginning. Um, Fargate was something that I uh, initially contemplated, but I wasn't sure uh, if we would run into different. Um, limitations with Fargate um, at the time. Uh, but now based on our usage pattern, I, I kind of feel like we may, you know, might have been nice to also use Fargate. Um, and then at that point, you could also, you know, go into other ways of doing it uh, without just using EPS with Fargate because it supports um, Kubernetes and things like that. Very good. But yeah, I'd be curious on uh, if anybody has experience uh, doing some of this stuff and, uh, you know, um, also, you know, you know, keep in touch with some of that. Uh, you know, using uh, Docker Swarm or uh, Kubernetes, and um, and uh, other approaches to solving this problem. There's more than one way to do this, obviously. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I do see sort of a trend where people are moving. Um, I, I see people moving away from ECS a bit. So, so part of that, um, there's there's actually two directions. The pro most prevalent one, of course, is moving to Kubernetes and EKS. So uh, we see a, a mm -hmm. fair amount of that. Um, and then the other thing is we actually, and this, this still surprises me, had a number of pretty major customers still using Swarm and firing up Swarm clusters, uh, using Terraform uh, on AWS and then dealing with that cluster um, and using traffic in that case. So the stack is not all that different, but but just using taking advantage of the um, uh, of, of swarm services. So um, yeah, just you know, let people know. I mean, any other questions? Um, you know, again, we're we're kind of uh, toward the the end of the presentation here, so I just leave one more last one last call. Uh, I'm watching the window here. If you have anything, and then of course, well, there's the perfect slide, the good setup. Thanks, bud. Uh, <laughs> if there are any questions, please. Uh, we send them over and we'll, we'll do that. We'll give you another minute or so. But um, otherwise, this is, we really appreciate uh, this bud. I mean, this was um, a great walkthrough, how somebody's really solving a problem. And, uh, you know, and where Docker uh, fits in, obviously, this being our uh, Docker Chicago meetup. So um, hoping to uh, inspire that your, your efforts here inspire others to come forward and, and share a little bit about what they're, uh, what they're doing out there as well. Um, and the, la the other thing too, I just wanted to say is, you know, we can set these up, particularly because they're virtual. And it's not like people have to, um, you know, set up a space and then people have to travel to get there and, you know, and, 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 you know all the overhead involved. So if people have shorter presentations as well. Um, so if you have almost, you know, I wouldn't say a lightning talk, maybe a little more than that, but maybe a uh, 20 minute talk, so the TED talk of uh, of Docker that would be interesting. The whole emotional aspect would be worth the price of admission, I think. But um, you know, just encourage people to to uh, pass that along, um, to uh, to share those uh, presentations. So anyway, I I don't see any more questions coming in right now, um, but I do want to take this time while we're waiting just to thank you so much for uh, for walking us through. And um, and I noticed you have some links down there. The geekaholic.org. Is there is there actually uh, something there? Oh yeah, there is a the site there. Bottom. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a blog. I haven't updated it for four or five years, so I should write a blog. <laughs> but but wow. I do have some projects on my GitHub page which I'm kind of uh, working on. Okay. And is there anything anything associated with? I assume that the stuff that you're doing that, that you talked about today is in your private repos for your company, so that's probably not you know out there. Yeah, yeah. This stuff is uh, yeah uh, in the top step repo. But um, you know this is there's nothing uh, magical about any of this. It's just you know work that yeah. you kind of fall. So yeah, anybody could do this. Sure, it, it, easy, easy enough, and and also um, any. So you're using GitHub for your repo. Have you any thoughts about you know GitHub Actions or anything like that coming into play with some some of the newer um, approaches to builds and things like that? That's something you guys are considering oh, yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah. So so I'm oh, sorry. So for this solution, yeah, we do. There is GitHub books on the pipeline at least to monitor changes. But yeah, you could you could easily um, you know put hooks to actually create the whole pipeline itself. Uh, but once the pipeline is created, it does use GitHub hooks um, to do the building. Yeah, very good. Fantastic. Well, I think what we'll do, um, John, Lynn, I don't know if you have any sort of wrap up things. I think we're we're sort of at the end of our conversation for today. And again, I wanna thank Bud for, uh, for taking us through. Uh, John, anything from you? I think we're all good. Thank you for the time. All right. Again, thanks, everybody. Uh, stay tuned. And please, again, if you have anything that you'd like to present on, uh, let us know. Um, I'm going to be doing one on uh, re really sort of the using uh, Windows subsystem for Linux uh, 2.0 with Docker Enterprise Desktop and some tooling uh, going along with that and uh, how that all fits together. It's kind of the, the rig I've been running on for for a while in the insiders uh, group with Microsoft. So I'd uh, be glad to share that in an upcoming one, but other ones that, so, so other thing, by the way, not just if you want to present, the topic that I'm doing is because somebody requested that topic. So if there's something you want to learn about, we can reach out to the community and see if we can find somebody to, to answer that call with a, with a presentation. So um, with that, I will uh, call it a day. Thanks everyone. Uh, have a fantastic evening.